All right. So um, welcome, everybody, to a new episode of our Einbase podcast. Um, Don Jose, welcome uh, to our studio. Um, our name in Dutch uh, means that uh, you are a final boss. And that means you are extremely good or well versed at something um, because I only like to talk to people who have done something uh, uh, exceptional. So I would like to welcome you to our studio. And maybe for uh, our listeners that don't know who you are, could you please introduce yourself uh, quickly? Um, what you do, what it is that you find important, um, and what your uh, uh, message basically is. So could you give a short introduction to who you are and what you do? Yes, thank you, Michael. Thank you for your invitation, and it's an honor to be in your studio and uh, communicating from uh, across the ocean to being one. And my name is Don Jose Ruiz. I come from the Eagle Knight lineage, from my Totec tradition. My family grow um, and make some teachings, and my father is well known for the four agreements. Mm -hmm. And uh, me and my brother right now, Miguel Jr., are carrying the flag of the Totec for this modern day of age. And there's nothing else to do than share the positive message out there in the world because the more that you give out there, it comes to you and becomes a lifestyle. So I really feel that it's very important for humanity to live a lifestyle of positivity, a, pos a lifestyle of, 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 you know, of open heart, because mm -hmm. this is how we can say thank you for life and to give us of life. So from that, we get all the inspiration to when people are having hard times and they cannot see themselves, they feel like they're stuck in a nightmare you know, with our presence, with our message, with our love, they can remind themselves who they are. So this is one thing that we do in the Totec tradition, remind everybody they're the artists of their life because Totec means artists of the spirit. Ah, that's beautiful. Yeah, let's let's start at the beginning because uh, one of the uh, central philosophies in uh, the work of your father, you, uh, your brother and you is shamanism. Um, shamanism that uh, stems from the ancient Toltec wisdom. Can you speak a little bit to what shamanism actually is? So if I'm an outsider and I don't know what shamanism is, what it, how would you define that? Well, shamanism, I can describe it not only from the Toltec tradition, but from many traditions. We can say that's the old religious uh, path that our human um, ancestors did because they worked with nature and they couldn't give away they didn't have. So they begin working with selves and the shaman tradition, we all know that our body is part of nature. Mm. It's the biggest container of nature where we live because this, we believe, this body doesn't matter we're male or female, this body that we have, it belongs to planet Earth, Divine Mother Earth. So when the spirit wakes up, it wakes up with a responsibility and a service of love. And that service of love is of gratitude to be alive. So in shamanism, we are service to nature. So you can see the shamanism from the old ancestors from you know Tibet, from the from Egypt, from Ireland, from um, from Northern Americas, from even South Americas, from all around the world, shamanism has been a practice. But it's a connection to our inner sun, which is our energy spirit. And then later in life, as other humans woke up and they get the tradition of their own, and religions were born, they begin being a, a, a seed of shamanism. But it's in all of them because all of them, you know, give gratitude to the father, son, to the divine mother. And then from this point on, we know that in shamanism, the language that we humans speak, the English, the French, the German, you know, it's just a, a symbol of communication to one another. Mm -hmm. And in this moment of time, we made it into gods. We made the word of gods, which is based on illusions. In shamanism, we know that everything is God. Everything is life. So in shamanism, it's a pathway to return back to your inner self and wake up so you can enjoy these beautiful dreams, but always being aware that everything's story, everything's illusion, that you pick your illusion, you pick your dreams, and you pick wherever you can serve. So this is the most precise thing about the shamanism, is to be at service to life. And we cannot give what we don't have, so it begins with ourselves. Wow. Powerful. Um, I have a question about that, because what you said was uh, shamanism is found all over the world. Um, are there... Um, and you spoke to a few themes, topics that, that run through this sort of primordial sort of spirituality. Um, is there something that if you look at that 
um, globally that sets the toll tax apart somehow? Is there, or is is it basically the same thing that sort of originated all over the world, or are, are there differences? It's the same thing. The only difference is how we express it, the oh. art that we express it, because the shamanism is always reminding that we are life, and what we're letting go is a human form. It's not that we're dying, it's that we're letting go the belief of what we think that we are. You know, we, we expire all the time that I'm gonna be, become this, I'm gonna become that. But the thing is just an experience of where we get essence and inspiration to create our art because what we really are is life. So we can totally understand that how many people create their art and they begin living in blind faith and defending like if it was a sports team, my team, you know, is better than other team. But mm -hmm. in sooner or later, people have lost their faith. Why? Because they, they know the lessons, but they don't leave them. And when you don't begin leaving the lessons, it's like begin hiding behind, you know, religion, behind love, that we don't know how to love. So in the shamanism, all around the world, we know how to love because we're grateful to be alive. And it doesn't matter what we are, what gender we are, what race we are. We know we have something inside of us to deliver. And when we deliver to ourselves, you know, we become walking in a museum, let's imagine. The whole world is a museum and every mind is an art piece. It's a way that it dreams. So there are many levels of awareness. So there are some minds that are asleep, some minds that are awake. Mm -hmm. But some minds that are asleep are going through something that they're going to come to an epiphany to wake up. And this is one thing that we all shamans from around the world, men and women, are in service to ourselves. So let's say we are a cup. And we overflow when we begin overflowing just by being ourselves we begin attracting like a honeycomb people who want to wake up because they feel something inside of us it's not that we have special powers it's that we have respect and we have gratitude to live the rest of our life with a different point of view and that's the point of view of service because this is the love of my life many people think that i find a human and i'm going to get married and that's the love of my life and then i get heartbroken it's because i give my love away then I depend on like a drug addict to depend that the love comes to me and then I feel for me, but that's not what it's about in shamanism. In mm -hmm. shamanism, it's like the sun and the moon and the stars. We're meant to just shine. We're just meant to love. And it's so beautiful when we allow ourselves to love with no story at all, with no block at all, with no doubt at all, and just be ourselves. So now when we have this essence of energy, how are we gonna describe it into words? And here comes the art. So we begin acknowledging some people's art, some traditions art because we are working for the same boss and one of my favorite things that I saw when I was growing up is when they got a Tibetan monk from mm -hmm. uh, one of the lineage of the Dalai Lama that was in Los Angeles and my father they put him in a group to meet so everybody was going to say what are they going to talk about what are they going to debate what are they going to say and when they got together they held hands and they look at everybody just like if they were great grandparents looking at all the children playing with knowledge but that's the message right there Peace, wisdom, knowledge, and love. When we get that in our behavior, we don't try to convince anybody we're living it. And then we become a presence. And this is what shamanism is. It's a presence of love. I, I get a sense of what you're saying. And at the same time, I'm trying to, to reconcile it with, with how I experience the world. And I think you're fully right. This, this should be the way to be as a human. But if I look at my own success at implementing that, it's why is it so hard to love in that way? You have yes, because we are addicted. That? Yes, because we are addicted to suffering. Let's say we're born minds, and they, they program in our phone, and our parents begin programming on what they know. And if we were religious, then you have no intercourse until you're like married. Mm -hmm. Other people they don't do stuff until this point. And they are protecting us because something happened in their life that they're protecting us, their little children from having that. But what happens after that? We're programmed, domesticated by fear. And mm -hmm. fear is the most, you know, contaminating thing about love. It also is the most powerful thing because fear deserves our respect because it shows us where to, we can overcome them when we feel weak. With that fear, we can corrupt love. They're saying, oh, this person is going to leave me. Let me possess this person instead. Mm -hmm. And we don't love this person. We're in fear they're going to leave us. So we begin manipulating them because we don't know how to love. In a divine relationship of respect, we let the, our partner do whatever they want to do in life that will make them happy because we want to see them happy because it's not our possession because they only have one life to live. Mm. And we have one life to live. 
and when we know how to love each other, it's because we respect one another to fly free. But at the same time, we make agreements in our relationship. And at the same time, we make agreements with our love. We cannot be what we don't have. So the beautiful thing about the Totec tradition is that we break our domestication. But now the real training of the Totec is to unlearn. Unlearn what? Mm -hmm. Unlearn what takes our inspiration away and take back what makes us inspired. And it's not about debating others. It's not about fighting. It's not about pride. It's not about validating. It's about setting ourselves free to experience everything that we want to be. Just like Siddhartha. Siddhartha had this temptation. Siddhartha had this wisdom. He saw suffering. He saw the bubble that he could get into, but he didn't feel alive in that bubble. It was the protection of his father protecting him in the kingdom until he went out to find it itself. And it mm -hmm. broke so many things from not eating, from being a, a master who didn't eat and just find it. And then he found, oh, it's okay to give food to my body. And when he jumped into giving food to his body, the people who follow him says, you betrayed us. We can no longer follow you. Siddhartha didn't judge himself. He let that peace go because it served his purpose. Now he went under the body tree to go against his own mind. And all of the things that were going into his mind, all the battles with Mara that he was facing, it was himself. And this comes now exactly like the Totec tradition. When we wake up and we're not happy in life, we look at everything that's taking us our happiness away. We begin to unlearn. And by unlearning, we take power out of the situation. Because, you know, when we do, when we are learned to pray all our life to something outside, but nothing's happening. Mm -hmm. And then all of a sudden, we find ourselves, we don't have enough time that we begin praying and we hear our own prayer. Then we begin taking action. And this is the magical thing, like you said, we do it in our own way. Because when we do it in our way, we can go further than waiting for someone to tell us what to do next, because then we're living their dream. But it comes a point where we respect our teachers who guided us, but respecting them is to live our life completely free. And it's not about being the shaman teacher or this great guru, no. Mm. It's about just enjoying our life. Yeah. Well, what I really like about what you just said is the fact that that you're the one that are, that's responsible for the waking up. So it's, it's in the action. So reaching... Let's not call it enlightenment, but but in growing, it only happens when when you as an individual start moving towards something. So start spending time and energy, so uh, uh, sort of exerting your will. But if you look at what you said earlier, kind of triggered me um, like the battle against yourself. And what I really liked about uh, the, the Toltec philosophy is that they. They, they put a name to something that I, I immediately recognized, um, the, the parasite. So mm -hmm. I don't know, Mitote was, mm -hmm. I think. What, yeah. Yeah, the parasite? Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Could you tell our listeners a little bit more about the concept of the parasite? Because it really resonated with me. And till this day, it still helped me with, well, I, I want to say conquer, but that's probably not the way to approach it. But, but <laughs> win sort of, yes. from the parasite, if you know what I mean. So could you talk about the parasite a little? Yes, the parasite, like the meaning of the parasite is a living being that fits over another living being, just like a whale. So let's imagine that we, our mind is the whale body and knowledge is the parasite. Yeah. And knowledge gets stuck into the whale body, the whale doesn't know that's there, but the parasite is doing its job and it's doing the job of domestication. Let's say we have fear, negative fear in relationship, in success or everything, that in the moment that that enters our thought, you're not good enough. You're not meant for love. You cannot change, you know? And we believe that we're suppressing ourselves. We're suppressing our life. We're suppressing even divine mother. If we believe that this body is divine mother, we're suppressing divine mother. But the moment that we wake up, mm -hmm. we can totally find that, oh, this is not the life that I want to live. I've been suppressing myself. Then we have the challenge to unlearn. And what we are learning about this parasite world is the way that we hurt ourselves, the way that we use the word and not being impeccable with it. We use the word, oh, you're not good. You're not good, Jose. You're not meant for love. Why are you even doing this interview? Why are you even doing this? You're not good enough. You build the butterflies and let the butterflies always step on you so you don't stand up. Let me do this for you. Let me guide you. You need anger. You need fear. You need, you know, to protect yourself from the world. But at one yeah. point, you know, you're sabotaging yourself. You're closing your heart. In one moment, you find like, this is not the way to live. I want to love everybody. I want to live openly. I want to have my heart completely free. And in that moment, I begin to see how I sabotage myself. So enlightenment for me is honesty. What am I doing in my life? 
What am I doing that I no longer will, you know, judge others and, you know, say that this is their fault because I'm not doing this. This is their fault because it's the parasite mind. They never want to take responsibility. Mm -hmm. But the moment that you begin witnessing your own head thinking like Tamitote, like you were saying earlier, the mitote is where the parasite lives because it's a thousand bucks at the same time and the parasite spitting of everything. But what happens one day if you enter your own mitote and you see the parasite and it begins running from you because you come from the truth. Because now you come not with the awareness of what it is, but you're coming with the awareness that you don't want it in your life anymore. Mm. And, and the beautiful thing is that now these days of age, it's being out there, the, knowing the parasite is being out there. And like a week ago, I was watching this Disney channel with my grandson and, uh, and they were showing these cartoons called Luca. And in that cartoon Luca, it was so beautiful because they described the parasite because there were two little friends and one friend was fearless doing what he loved to do. And the other one began having fear and says, you know, I once discovered what you're hearing the voice in your head, one said to the other, and I call it Bruno which means fear. So Bruno for them was the parasite. Mm. And so he said, every time you want to do something, brother, just say silencio Bruno, silence Bruno, because it identified that is that voice that is sabotaging, but it's not itself, it's that per the programming. So the moment that we are aware of our heart and we find our own voice using it against ourselves, we say silencio Jose, mm. silencio. I will go with my heart open and you will not stop me. So it's will against temptation. So I couldn't see this unless I was honest with myself. And that's like enlightenment. That. Yes, silencio Michelle. I'm going to use that one. It's a nice mantra to have. Yes, and it's so simple. Great. You know, yeah, it's so it simple. Is. But but I, but I bet you, my brother, that we are so complicated as humans that we make it so complicated. It cannot be that simple. But it is. <laughs> it is that simple. That's the beautiful like thing about the agreements. Because when we read the agreements, the four of them, they look so simple. But when we try to apply them, they're difficult because of the attachments we have of not mm. being impeccable with the word, of using the word against ourselves and others, about making assumptions because we're not afraid to speak up, about, you know, don't take things personal because we take everything personal because we, we take everything personal, we can use that situation to hurt ourselves and yeah. have an excuse why not to be successful in love and life. But when we do our best, that agreement is my father's favorite because that is what make all our demons come alive and, and how I help myself to become to this four agreements in my life to apply them, it was the fifth, is to be skeptical of my own poison words, of my own negativity, not about anybody else's, forget anybody else's. It's easy to, but when it's myself, when I stop believing those lies because I was skeptical of my own negativity and in an imaginary, I imagined that I was the scorpion stinging itself with my own tail. And mm. that's what it was. I was thinking, but then I was immune to my tail. I said, stop it, Jose. That's not gonna. That's not gonna stick me anymore because I have woken up. I understand. I understand. Um, well, what I, you already uh, already touched on um, sort of the antidote because uh, what I found um, most powerful about the Toltec uh, traditions or philosophy was. Well, basically what you said, they were so ridiculously simple that I had to ask myself, is this really, is this really the way it can't be that easy, right? But it's like, like you said, simple, but not easy. Like they sound easy enough, like uh, don't take anything personal. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sounds like a great idea. But how do you actually do that? Um, and maybe we can talk about that a little bit more. And I have one more question uh, about uh, the parasite for you. Have you ever wondered about uh, its origin? So uh, as, I, as I look at humans, I'm always so fascinated by the fact that we're so conflicted. And if I try to put that into real world knowledge like biology or, or evolution, I'm like, what does this serve? Why is this here? It seems so inefficient. So, so it's because, uh, yes, it, it, it has to do with betrayal. Hmm. We betray ourselves. We betray ourselves with our word that we don't trust ourselves. And if we don't trust ourselves, we don't trust others. And in that untrust, we become irritated and hurt. Mm. And then we protect ourselves from others. And then we begin hurting others before they hurt us. But when we hurt others, our consciousness becomes dirty because we have hurt. And then we try to numb that. And the more numb we do in our actions, the more 
numb we become, emotionless, and that's the dream of machista, the machismo dream suppresses its feelings, and it, it and it's a bully, and it suppresses divine mother's dream, and when we when we uh, in the total creation when we acknowledge the divine mother, the full moon, is because it's inside of us. So how we treat ourselves is how we're treating her. How we treat other people is how we're treating her. So it becomes an impersonal thing in life. It becomes a personal thing that people are infected with a disease of suffering. I tell you, if people scream at us, we can see it if we take it personally to scream back. But if we have the awareness, we notice that they're only asking for help because they are infected with suffering. And the more they scream, the more they're negative, they're asking for help. We who are tired of living that way, we go into the battle against the parasite, against ourselves. we take our power back. And that's the dream of the warrior. The warrior is between truth and lies, not good and evil. Mm -hmm. So when we stop believing in lies, let's say my father got interviewed probably like a year ago. And this beautiful man asked him, how is it that you're going in this election that's happening in the United States where this person is talking bad about your race, talking bad about you, do you take that personally? Go, no, no, I don't take it personally. And how can you not take it personally? He's talking about about your people. And he responded, how would I take, you know, personally something that is not real? He's attacking me. He's attacking my family. He's attacking my race. But I know it's not real. Why should I react? I let just this little thing be in hate. But it's not real. Why should I give my power away? And this is when we have awareness in our life, in our families, in our, in our marriage, in our relationships with our friends in school, when they're lying and we know it's not real, why should we take them? And the addiction of suffering is waiting for a battle to happen. You know, people who are addicted to gossip, they're waiting for the next juicy gossip so they can spread around and be hypocritical. And then they see this person making nothing happen. But people are stabbing themselves in the back because they don't trust each other. The moment they, and they do that action because they're doing that to themselves. And now the body gets irritated, gets hurt, is looking for that addiction, is protecting itself from itself. And this is beautiful. In one point, when we come aware that we're protecting ourselves from ourselves, then we know that nothing outside it has to do with us. I get it. The, the, the thing I'm, I'm wondering about when I hear you say that is, um, because if you talk about things like good and evil and moral absolutes, then a philosopher would usually say, well, there, it, it depends on the person and the perspective and there is no true. But what I hear you saying is that we all have a sort of internal compass. Like, let's take gossip as a very down to earth. Uh, you kind of know it's not right. Right. There's there's something in you that that kind of knows ah, this is this is kind of dirty. Right. Um so there, there's a there's a, a innate sense of right and wrong in people, and um, I, I was wondering uh, because uh, a, a, an anthropologist will tell you that's culture, but what I'm wondering is is that something that stems from our nature? If if you if you look back at what you started with, uh, where life manifests, experiencing uh, itself, do you think that's something that that comes with default programming? If you understand my question. Yes, because uh, we're programmed without integrity. And when mm -hmm. we go against integrity, we misuse our intent. Now, when we are using our intent, we can see clearly what we are dreaming about. And it's about consciously. If you do an act that disrupts your consciously, you will beat yourself up every day. And we remember that memory. And it could be 20 years and you're still doing that. But mm -hmm. the moment that you wake up consciously, you will not go against your consciously, your moral consciously. Like, you know, I am very much respecting the dream of animals now for six years when I was a carnivore completely. I used to eat every meat. But six years ago, an epiphany happened that, you know, the animals deserve to live. I, I'm who am I to take that, you know, I'm not that hungry. Then I begin looking at the little bugs. And for somebody living their life, oh, they're just bugs, you know, who cares? But for me, it's loud enough because I have that respect of integrity that when I begin doing that, my life completely changed. And, and, and for me, that's my truth. I cannot, I cannot do things that go against my consciousness because I go against myself. Mm. And we have been domesticated to not take things personal, to have excuses, to have justifications, to keep doing what we're doing. And then the dream enables us and they call it normal. Like they call suffering normal, but it's not normal. There's pain that is normal. Someone dies, we feel it is normal, but to hurt ourselves with that death after 30 years that that event has happened is not normal. And we're looking for any option to do it. 
then we become being like the crabs in a bucket. When somebody's about to escape because of what we think is normal, we put them down and we make them questioning. So when we wake up from our own dream and we figure how we're lying, it has totally separated from the dream of the planet. And the dream of the planet, how we're talking in the Totec tradition, has nothing to do with the planet itself. It has to do with what we humans have created in our life and how we're defending our stories. Like for me at this point, I use knowledge, yes, when I used to use it against myself and against others, but now it came a point where I had an epiphany to respect the knowledge, respect the words, put that energy that I have into everything that I speak. Now mm -hmm. I speak a different language, even if I speak English and Spanish in my life, I speak it differently. I use the words differently because I use it in my own vocabulary, how I'm building my dream. And, uh, and then I know that I am more than words. How can 10,000 years of language be the truth in this universal world? And then I know the feeling and the vibration that I put into every word, that is my real. And you know, there's many masters who have speak about this. Even the ancient one that we were speak of when I was little about Jesus, when he was crucified and go save yourself. And he goes, my kingdom is not of your kingdom. And imagine everybody acknowledging their kingdom and they don't have to defend it. And they're not being attacked by it. Everybody is respecting their kingdom and their kingdom, it is what consciously makes them feel alive, positive, like mm -hmm. acknowledge. And you know, from this point on, we wake up where everybody's completely sleeping. Like my father says in the four agreements, imagine you're the only sober person where everybody's completely drunk yeah. and they're drunk in order to be right. They're drunk to live in a mask. But when you look from the point of view of an elder, you let everybody have their dream. You let every child play with their toy. And in this life, we're playing with toys of knowledge. Hmm. Interesting. I would like to know uh, a little bit more about that transition you went through because um, the, the, the power of the word has always fascinated me. Um, the, the fact that we can make sounds with our mouth and that hmm. What we say, what we mean, and, and the way we say it has the option to move mountains, basically. So it can push. It's almost like magic, right? Um, and what I like about it is, is the combination with, and I think this is what makes humans unique, is we can verbalize our will. So there's something that we would like to manifest, and we can put that into sound symbols, and with that we can put things into motion, go into action and make others go into action with yes. a result as, as, um, as an effect. So th this always fascinated me. And I think humans are, of course, you see communication in other uh, uh, animals, but we're by far uh, the best at it. Now, when it comes to the first agreement, uh, I think you already touched on that essence, but I I'm very curious about the transition that you went through in the way you used your word and what the effects were. So do you have some practical uh, examples of, of, of the changes that you made, uh, made in the way you say things, for example, to yourself or to others? Yes, um, there's so many, many lessons that I received to, to get power in my word. And one of the beautiful things is when I, when I was young, I, I went to India and I was like 17 and I, I spent a few months there. But when I came back, I was very disciplined in meditation. I could meditate for eight hours a day, you know, with my mala. And then my, my dad, this is how he teach me. I used to do my, with my mala, I used to do my, my normal um, Hindu meditations, my ma mm -hmm. mantras that they give to me in India, my stepbrother. So I used to do them. So it came a point when I was doing them and my father came to me and says, what are you doing, son? I'm doing the universal mantra so I can transcend. And he goes, he laughed at me. He goes, no, you're not transcending. You're abusing meditation. And I took it so personal, brother, because here I am sitting in eight hours a day, getting my knees all cranked up, getting my bum bum very numb, you know, and I, there's, there's, there's flies in my nose and I can't even move, you know, because I'm in discipline and uh -huh. doing the mantra. So I said, but I'm doing this. He goes, yes, you have discipline, but you're using it against you. You know, you're not even knowing what words you say. And he started training me with meditating with the eyes open. And after I begin meditating with eyes open and I close, and uh, he gave me this, this assignment now. He says, I want you to do mantras so you don't corrupt the mantras that you learned from India. I don't want you to corrupt them. I want you to honor them. So I give you this lesson. When you get the eight, 108 beats, you do something that's hurting you in your life. Let's say you're jealous in your relationship. In that mm -hmm. time, I was feeling that, that dream. 
So he goes, I don't have time to be jealous. I don't have time to be jealous. 108 times, I don't have time to be jealous. I don't have time to be afraid. I don't have time to be victim. And he taught me all these things when every time I was doing that for myself, getting a story, a juicy story that just happening to me, even his, his heart attack, you know, he's almost dying. He told me, you know, I don't have time to, 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 um, to, to, um, what's that word? To not honor your debt, to Sabbath, you know, to disrespect yeah. you. I don't have yeah, time yeah. to do that. I have to honor you. So even in the hardest time, he made me put my emotion into my words and my words had power like going through fire. And then I could see my own manifest. And then after that, he told me, what have you been doing? Now it's, now you're training the messenger, which is the fifth agreement, the whole point about training the messenger that we wake up and we train ourselves. And then after that, he goes, okay, now you can do your universal mantra in Hindu again. And I tell you, when I began doing the universal mantra in Hindu, I wasn't hiding behind it anymore. That activated energy that, that I put into my words, now was coming into silence, into acting and in little words I begin acting up my intent and when I act my, my intent is what I act my integrity because intent and integrity go together in hand and yeah. I have a little example about the manifestation and powers that we have you know we all are antennas to create mm. and one of the favorite stories that had nothing to do with spiritual masters in the temples it had to do with spiritual masters in the music industry there was a story when uh, Michael Jackson wakes up around three or four in the morning because he had this song in his head. Mm -hmm. So he calls his engineer and his engineer waking up, come on, Michael, it's three, four in the morning. He goes, I got this song in my head. I need to put it down But Michael. It's late, you need to rest. And he said, God doesn't rest. And he goes, I know, Michael, that's why you need to rest because God doesn't rest. Why do you want to record it right now? And he's because I have this message in my head and I want to do it right now before Prince wakes up and do it himself. Mm -hmm. before prince wakes up and he does it so he wanted to yeah, because this is the point of humanity we all get ideas but who's going to do it first and who's going to get in the way of those ideas to be manifested so mm -hmm. that's one of the beautiful things when we are the artists of our life and we do what we love to do like you and me right now we like to be in service to life to make people happy to give gems because we work for the same boss and when we have the understanding that all the shamans around the world and to say shamans, I'm not only talking about healing people. I'm talking everybody who opens their heart because they open up a presence. We come and take over in whatever story language that we are. But the important thing is that we are in integrity with ourselves. And when we are in integrity with ourselves, we know when we're lying to ourselves, when we're honest with ourselves, when we're feeling bad. And the first rule of the art of happiness is that we're not happy all the time. And then it's when we use all this gift of knowledge to calm ourselves down, to not believe in lies. Yeah, it sounds like you're saying that what we're trying to do, uh, if I if I got it really short, is trying to get out of our own way. Yes. Yes. That, that's what it's all about. And, and the way to do this is to have your inner monologue in a certain way. Because I, I have a question about this, what you call intent. I think we mean the same thing. Um, but the, 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 there's another word I, I use for co your convictions. So um, there's some stuff that you believe and, uh, and um, I've, I've spoken to groups of people and sometimes there are moments when I say certain things, but there is doubt in the back of my mind. But there are also times where I am truly feeling what I am saying and I'm, I'm not really, I don't know really, I don't really know what I'm saying. I'm just saying things, but I know one thing. I really feel this stuff. And, and I can tell the effect on other people is, is far greater. But it is because I believe the things that I am saying 100%. And, and what I found very interesting about that is that if there's things that you believe 100%, there's a real effect. Uh, for example, and this fascinates me to no end, the placebo effect, for example. It, it's sort of in the same category of believing. If you, you know what placebo is like, right? If we give you sugar pills and we tell you, hey, this cures headaches. Yes. There's a chance it cures headaches. And, and I think the central mechanism is what you believe about yes. that particular thing. And I think it's the same for words. Could you speak about that a, a little bit more? Yes, brother. I'm totally 100% with you because you're talking about the power of faith. When we have the power of faith, not hope. Hope is thinking the comet's going to pass. Mm. But when we have faith in our words, oh, the comet is coming. 
and we are the comet. And when we have faith in ourselves, it is like the mind begins channeling, but it's not channeling other people. It's channeling life. It's channeling what we believe in. And when we believe in, we have, we're passionate about it. And when we're passionate about something that we put the placebo energy because it wakes our intent. Now our intent is going through a direction. And the beautiful thing about this that I perceive when I have intent and I open my channels up is because I'm speaking to my heart. It's like if I am in an abandoned theater and there's no need for audience because my heart begins clapping every time I give a dream. And the more I ignite that fire, I'm feeling the fire within. And you know, I'm using words, I'm using illusions for me. Even though I know it's not real, I'm using something that I believe in that for me, it becomes real, but it's a stepping stone. So that words, they're not the main God. There is a stairway to God or to divinity or to find the creating fire that we're here to do because we all of us are here to create a masterpiece of art. And when we have faith with ourselves, brother, like you said, when we believe in ourselves, we create this, this placebo. It is like Dumbo. Dumbo could always fly. But the tricksters, the shaman, the crows gave him the magic feather. And he gave all the power, the placebo to the magic feather yeah. until the moment that he fell down from the ladder, he lost his feather. He thought he was going to die. He was putting all this doubt. And then his consciousness, which is a little mouse, but it was his own mind. He's saying, silencio dumbo. <laughs> you are, you are that intent. You don't need that. You believe in yourself and you can do it. And in that moment, he flew. I love the story because if I can tell it to children in the most simplest way and they get it, the adult can see all the why nots, all the knowledge put in, but at the end, there's no fighting what you believe. And that's why being skeptical of your own negativity helps you extracting your faith because you're overcoming. You're walking mm -hmm. through fire and it's not burning, but the passion that if you can give something to the altar and there's fire and flames across the altar in you, your faith will make you walk over fire and not get burned to deliver that. And that's exactly what emotions are. They're fire that can burn us. But when we're strong with faith and love, then nothing will happen to us because we got our back. This is the angel that we're training in the fifth agreement. And the angel is the messenger. And the messenger is the artist Like you said earlier. We humans, we're the greatest shape shifters because we're in power. We're at the top of the chain in this world because we can, like in the new book, The Power Animals, it's all about that the power animals don't come to us. Mm. We use the animals to inspire ourselves. Like I use the jaguar, the strength of the jaguar as the mind, the jungle, but the jaguar wakes up in me, so I use it to stalk myself. It's that the jaguar could care less. Like we say in the fifth agreement, the dogs don't know that they're dogs, the cats don't know they're cats. They just are. And that leads me to me. They say that I'm human. They say that I'm spirit. They say that I'm energy. They say that I'm light, but I don't know what I am. But I know that I am life. And now from this point on, I don't believe in who I am because that who will get trapped in the mirror if I wanted to and believe that. But I'm not Jose. I am something else. Like you're something else. Mm -hmm. We use Michael and Jose to communicate with the world, to the characters, to have fun, to enjoy life. But deep inside, we know with this awareness, that we're here on vacation in this life. And when we have the point of view that we're on vacation, we're not gonna ruin it for someone else's drama or stories or victimizations. And when we lose our suitcase, we say goodbye to it and we get a new one. And the suitcase is dreams, junior high, elementary, high school, marriage, work, characters, friendships. Because I remember having close to friends but when they got their families, their children, when we get together, we just talk about memories about ghost town in a place we don't belong anymore. We enjoy ourselves with time, but we all move on in life. And this is something beautiful about the connectedness net of love because we all get together in our life. We're putting a brick spread like a big sheet, but everything that we do will remain here on this earth because it's our art. Like John Lennon, every time that I hear that song, I'm playing those mind games. You know, that song, Mind Games, mm -hmm. reminds me of the dream of the planet and being there. And it reminds me that I'm just here to love. We're playing these mind games together. But at the same time, they're just games. And one day my nephew, my, my grandchild was playing a game and we're playing Transformers. You know, he was pretending he was Optimus Prime or Bumblebee. But he <laughs> fell and, and hit his knee and he was crying because he, heard, and he goes, pause the game. And when he said that, I was looking at life, you know, we are here to enjoy, 
but there comes a moment that happens in life where we pause the game. And all of us, let's say if someone is in the hospital of our families, we pause the game, we pause the grudges, we pause the, the negative things that we make peace. Mm. But we're waiting for that hurt for happen. What do you imagine if we can pause the game, jumping and help everybody have their dream and visit them like if they were nothing to do with us, but we enjoy their beauty, but we always honor where our body is respected because I'm not going to put my physical body, my Jose, the love of my life, I'm not going to put him in a world where he's going to get, you know, racially discriminated or put down or, you know, or be bullied at. I'm going to put Jose where it's love and respect because this is my responsibility, including not only implicitly outside, but in the within. All my life, this Jose has been loyal to my body, to my mind. Now it's time for my mind to be loyal to the rest of Jose. And that's why I say in the Totic tradition, there's nothing to learn but to unlearn what takes our inspiration away. Yeah, I think that's one of the biggest insights because I've read this book a couple of times and um, for the longest time, I took it so literally um, in the sense that was, well, you got to be uh, impeccable. Which you can't lie. You got to tell the truth. You cannot lie to yourself. You have to be honest. But I'm starting to realize more and more that it's very literal in the sense that what you say, uh, I mean, you shouldn't lie to yourself. Sure. But there's several ways you can you, you can do that. Right. Or, or the two of you accept to tell it to yourself. And what I'm getting from, where, from what you're saying is that if you look at it like a game, the way you talk to yourself. So what you say determines the game. Yeah. So that, what you believe so if you want to play a cool game, that's what you got. That's what you got. That's what you got to say. But if you want to yeah. suffer, well, we can have that as well. It just depends on the way you talk to yourself. Yes. And like, and like my brother said once in a lecture, I heard him say, you know, sometimes people are impeccable with the word, but they say with so much poison that they're not impeccable at all. They use the truth with so much poison to yeah. hurt people. And, and, you know, and they, they think they're in a high horse, but it's not about that. It's about, like you said, it's about how you feel after that. And it comes to a point where you wake up and you're now realizing what relationship you want to be in. Do I want to play a game of relationship of drama? You know, and, and it's worth the price. And, and, and then somebody said to me, well, why are we paying? I'll say, well, we all pay. I'm not paying for love. Because we all pay because we all pay with our time. Time yeah. is something that we won't get back. Even the most powerful rich people cannot buy time. Yeah. So how we use our time in our life is the most richness it is. So let's say we let everybody have their poison. That's what they want to choose. But in our life, we want to live in integrity. And here comes now the passing of the torch because the little children, they learn not what we say to them. They copy exactly what we do. Mm -hmm. And then we punish them and set them up for failure. And then there, there it is, guilt and shame passing on to the next generations. This is why it's important for all of us to walk our truth, to live in our path of authenticity. And people say, what is the truth? But the truth is not in words. The truth is just an act of personal freedom. Mm. I really like that. I really like that. Only the thing is that in trying to do that, um, we also come into contact with others, people yes. living their own dreams. And uh, in those uh, <laughs> uh, interactions, sometimes you get some feedback. And uh, sometimes the feedback is very positive. Sometimes the feedback is negative. Um, mm -hmm. and, and then that's uh, when I look at um, uh, the parasite, in me personally, that's where it's at its strongest because it will get very uh, prickly. <laughs> yes. <laughs> very and, and, defensive. Uh, it will think yeah. that everybody's at fault except uh, me, which, which yeah. if you go back to the first one, I shouldn't be saying that to myself because it's completely fair looking at all the things that you said. But escaping that, not taking stuff too personal trap. Maybe you've developed a few tricks for that as well. <laughs> yes, because what, one, one thing is, is, you know, when we used to take personal, we went to debate in order to be in the truth and to be right. We lost a lot of time. We lost a lot of friendship. We may mm -hmm. even lose a lot of relationships. For what? What's the price? What's, what was it really important? And, and this is when we really realize as, as honesty, you know, when we know it, that our parasite mind is defensive, it's because we're holding on to something that we don't want to look into the mirror. Mm -hmm. When we're honest about ourselves and just completely are naked to ourselves, no one can blackmail us. No one can judge us. They may say things about us because they're saying it about themselves. 
but we take that personally to us, we will defend us because they touch a wound, they touch a nerve, so we will fight back. Mm -hmm. But this is the point of the, of the awareness. You know, this has nothing to do with my heaven. Even if I'm doing this battle, where will I leave? The most powerful thing it is to open the love. Like one time when I did the wisdom of the shamans, I got invited to this, uh, to this speaking. I didn't know it was gonna be a debate because I don't do debates. But the person wanted to debate me over what shamanism. And I was just saying, you know, shamanism is just point of love, but they were putting it in one point of view of one tribe without with, in putting down the rest of the tribes. Mm -hmm. But the moment that I was just honoring myself as a healing tool of shamanism did to me, I was being honest with myself. And this is what many people, they're not honest with themselves. They hide behind knowledge, they hide behind teaching, and they hide behind fancy words. Yeah. And the that moment... One, sure. That one resonates yeah. with me because I think I'm very guilty of that. Because you said, if you said debates, I love debates. <laughs> but but, but <laughs> listening to what you're saying, I kind of get where that where that's coming from if we look at it from that perspective. Yes, because this is the point, like my brother teaches, when we're debating, we're trying to domesticate each other. Who yeah. is the right one? But when we're just dreaming, passing by, just try to domesticate us, but it doesn't affect us. So we just see how this person dreams. So when we don't react to this debate to this person, we're downloading how that person dreams without even gossiping about ourselves. But when it's important, then we do it. When it's not important, we don't do it. Yeah, so, so we do it. Is that a bad thing, right? Because sometimes I think um, there needs to be an interaction like that, right? A, a sort of domestication, maybe for, for practical reasons, uh, for example. And uh, if I look at, uh, for example, uh, monkeys, I think they have, sort of have similar dynamics going on every now and then. There's a regulated, like if there's relationships, there's going to be friction and that, that gets, there's going to be fights and stuff like that. Yeah. Um, but, but it, it kind of serves a function. But what is it, and maybe you've thought about this, in, in human personality or maybe certain certain types of personalities, um, that they really, there's something in them that really likes that. Like if I look yes. at myself, I really like that domestic. If I domesticate someone else, that feels good to me somehow. And it, it doesn't have to be a negative domestication. It can also teaching them certain things. Like, for example, a martial art where you're supposed to behave in a certain manner. Um, but that kind of has a good feeling because they're doing what I'm saying. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> what that is. Yes, uh, there's, there's, two, there's two types of, 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 of teaching. If you talk and debate with, the, with an ego, you will go nowhere. Mm. But if you go and debate with someone who's living in hell and suffering, who's wounded, who wants to change their life, then it's worth it. Right. So and the one who wants to. And the one who wants to train for karate or for exercise is because they don't want to be bullied anymore. Mm -hmm. And sometimes when we domesticate somebody without their asking, it's because we want to feel safe. So if we domesticate, we feel safe because the secondary character will not leave us. How do you feel about uh, standing up for yourself? Uh, I'm not an advocate for violence, um, but sometimes there are situations, for example, in the case of a bully, um, in Holland, we are taught if you get bullied, you better, you know, you have to punch them because, or else they keep bullying. Um, and I think if I look at nature, every now and then you got to show your teeth, but it's not very loving to the other other person. You know what I mean? And, and Jesus would say, you turn the other cheek. Um, how do you feel about that? Well, you have to defend yourself. It's like it, the sacred art, martial arts from the, the monks in the East. Mm. They're silent but they know how to defend themselves because it was a point one time that there was this, this, this awakened master, this, this, karate, this karate master, my friend was telling me this story that you know that it's, um, it was in peace, but the, the people were coming into this village where monk lives. Mm -hmm. And every year they come, they steal their food, they beat them up. So one time the warrior came and said, okay, I'm gonna train the monks so they can defend themselves. So when they come, they cannot steal from them anymore. So he began training this new teaching. And this new teaching was between meditation and defending yourself and not attacking. Mm -hmm. And they, when they defend themselves, they're not killing them. They're paralyzing them. They're stopping them. And that, that's the whole point of defend. Because at one point, if someone comes into my house, I have to defend my, my partner and my puppies. There's no doubt about that. 
I wake up, I don't like how to do, but that's a part that I like to do. I avoid that. But it comes a point that in our life that we really have to stand up. But I tell you, the biggest bully that is in the life is this one inside. Yeah. <laughs> when I tell you, brother, it, it came a point in my, in my youthfulness before I mastered myself, but I know this dynamic. When I was honoring this mind, I became many friends with different gang members from different gangs. Mm. And when they were together, they respected me so much that they were not fighting each other because they loved the presence. But when they believe the hype or what they're supposed to do, then uh, they believe the lies in order to be bullied, to get teased, they had to do whatever went against their consciousness. Mm. I understand. I understand. So it's important to be able to stand up for what you believe in, but there is a turning point and then it's just working against yourself and covering up your fears and then it's not all right. Gotcha, gotcha. I was just wondering because sometimes that's, you know, uh, when you talk about, um, for example, uh, not domesticating other people, um, well, exerting your will on certain people can be violent as well, right? It doesn't have to be physical violence. So I was just wondering. About yes, it's like my, my, my it's, it's like that joke that happens, you know, when, um, when a couple is fighting in their homes, they, they, they call the police for a domestic, a domestic problem. A domestic problem because they, they're having a problem domesticating each other. Ah, yes. <laughs> I'm sorry. I was a bit late to that one. But yeah, yeah, I understand. Yes, yes. Um, all right. So um, back to uh, conquering that, that inner parasite, right? We're almost done with the four agreements. And then I would love to move on to um, some more uh, shamanic insights. Um, the, the one that, that almost, uh, always seemed most easy to me uh, proved the most difficult, and that was the one about making assumptions. So if you, if you look at that one, what's the most common mistake uh, you see people that are well, with this make? Yeah, the, the assumption comes from, from my point of view, people who, who are afraid to speak the truth. People who speak to communicate their feelings or their things with somebody else. That instead of, you know, going and speaking how things are, that they, they assume that they think this way. They assume that they think that way. They assume they did these things without even asking. One of the, my favorite things that I that I that make me enjoy this disagreement, I was in Detroit, and uh, they were talking about the four agreements to sixth graders in elementary, and they asked a sixth grader, "What's your favorite agreement?" And I was surprised they were asking a sixth grader, and uh, he was saying, "Don't make assumptions," and they asking, "Why? Why that one?" And they said, "It's because these kids." You know, they think I don't want to be their friend. They find one of them, but I want to be their friend. I really want to be their friend. Mm. And they make assumption that I don't want to be their friends, but I do want to be their friends. Little things like that. Uh, let's uh, just time out on the game. How awesome is that? Writing a book but with these lessons and seeing six-year-olds, like, you know, being able to uh, uh, get it out of there, just, just talk about it. And from the top of their minds, be able to... Uh, um, name them. That must be awesome, right? Yes. And this is the generation that's coming out. Yeah, that's, that's why. That's why it's important for us to walk our authentic path, to be, to overcome our fears and domestication that's been su su suffocating us. Mm -hmm. So we don't give that to the little ones anymore without blaming our parents or their parents because they did their best. But if we wake up knowing that we want to change our legacy is to look at self at the mirror and completely change the agreement that we're making with ourselves. Because aware or not, it's affecting our little ones. So when you have this awakeness, you're going to pass the torch. So this is why we say in the fifth agreement, what is the message that we say to ourselves and to the people that we say that we love with all our heart? Because that's what we're giving to ourselves and to them. And we don't like it. Let's change that message. Yeah, exactly. Start, like, you know, being impeccable with your word on that one and see the effect. Um, I like that one. Um, and when you spoke to um, um, just now was in doing your best. And um, I think you told me that that was your father's favorite uh, of, the yes. four, of the five agreements. Why is that? Why is that one his favorite? It's because that's the one that gives life to all of them. If we, if we don't do our best, how can we, you know, be impeccable with the word? 
not and take things per, not take things personal and, and, and not make assumptions. Mm -hmm. When we do our best, we do our all our best. And this is the most beautiful part about the, the fourth agreement, doing our best. If we don't judge ourselves, no one else can judge us. If we did our best and stop judging ourselves that we didn't give any more, the judgment will die because automatically we we judge ourselves for not wanting to pour water from the phone. You know, I want to get water from the rock and I judge myself that I cannot do that. Mm -hmm. We did our best. Oh, that's a very interesting interpretation. I, I, I usually take another route with it. Um, but, but this one is way more powerful because if you know you did your best, no one can touch you. That's basically what I understood that to mean. And the way I uh, sometimes ex explain this one, or at least I interpreted it, was if you do your best, a lot of people um, don't attempt certain things because they're uh, afraid of what other people might think, right? Um, and if you do your utmost, so if you do the best that you can, in my experiences, people will judge you differently if you fail, because this is your fear. You will fail and people will judge you for it. But if you did your utmost, the, the judgment will be positive. So if you see someone and he's trying everything that he can do to accomplish a certain goal and he fails, you're like, ah, oh, that's too bad. But at least he went for it, right? And the other yeah. way around is if you see someone and he's really phoning it in, and he fails, you're kind of like, yeah, that, that makes perfect good. That, that should happen. You know what I mean? So, so the, the fear comes true. So if you as an individual do your utmost and you're wondering, should I do this, yes or no, because people might judge me harshly if I fail, if you just do your best, chances are they will judge you very positively for just trying. Yes. That, that kind of puts the dependency on the people on the outside. And what I like more about your interpretation was that it's, it's just me now. <laughs> yes, because, <laughs> because, for, because for me, the dream of judgment, you know, you know, whatever we do, we're going to get judged anyways. Yeah. You know, yeah. We, we, before I wasn't vegan, I got judged for not being vegan. Now that I'm vegan, I judge for being vegan. You know, there was judgments before I was born. It judgments when I'm alive and there will be judgments after I die. Yeah. When I know that this judgment is just an illusion to sabotage each other's dreams in humanity, that doesn't exist in my life anymore. I feel it, but that is what I turn into medicine. That is my inspiration. When I feel that I have even more faith in myself, that I can overcome it. And when we see people trying and doing, let's say the judgment, it is just an honor because we're grateful for them. Of course, I'm going to train this person because it wants to do its best. But if I see someone with ego, I want to train that person because that person doesn't want to get out of suffering. He wants to use the words that I give him to get more weapons to sabotage life. But the ones who want to get out of suffering, I will make them my apprentice. And, 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 and this is the most beautiful thing about life. When we wake up knowing that if we believe in ourselves, we're powerful. But if we believe that we're more powerful than anybody else, we're weak. I like that, 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 that distinction between people that just want to prolong the suffering um, or people that try to escape it because those people's opinions might matter to you. You can, because it's, it's kind of worth it. It might be a strange uh, segue, but do you by any chance watch the series Rick and Morty? Do you know what I'm talking about? I, I, I've seen Rick and Morty. There's one quote I have to think about when I heard you say that. It, it, it goes like, your booze mean nothing to me. I've seen what makes you cheer. Right. Yes. So, so I see what you value. So that's why, well, why would I bother? Because like, yes. you're all about suffering and I'm not going to, like, I'm not even touching that. So that's what would have made me figure. I like that one. All right. Um, great. And then there's uh, one more, the final one, the fifth. And I have a confession to make <laughs> because this is one of my biggest uh, screw ups uh, when it comes to uh, this one. Um, I wrote a book. And I wrote about the four agreements in my book. Uh, and I also spoke about the fifth one. And in my book, I wrote down the fifth agreement is unconditional self-love. And then I started prepping for this podcast. And then I was like, no, that's not the fifth agreement. <laughs> I like this one as well. <laughs> but I have no idea how I messed that one up. But um, the, the true fifth agreement is um, listen, but be critical. And... I thought that to mean uh, listen, uh, be critical about what other people are saying to you, but it basically means be very critical about what that inner voice is telling you, correct? Yes, 
And I, but it, I, I have to say, brother, it is about inner love. Because when you're about inner love, it's, it's about when you stop listening to lies. And in the translation got lost a little bit because yeah. where I come from, in the words in English, it means the fifth agreement is to be skeptical, but learn to listen with the heart. Wow. And when you listen, and when you learn to listen with your heart, is that you begin listening to your own words. And when you begin saying, I'm not meant for love, I can never love again, is that really truth? I'm not being skeptical in the outside or criticism in the outside. I'm being, you know, with a with a judge has been cruel all my life. Mm -hmm. I'm changing the rule of law in my head by not believing in those old laws and I'm changing them. Well, now that, I now I'm skeptical of saying I cannot do it. I did it. Whatever I wanted to do, I did it. And what I did is that I woke up to love the love of my life. That is Jose to support the love of my life and wow. to get that mask out and say, thank you for the good times, for the bad times. I don't need you anymore. I am free. There's nothing to hide. I can just be, be with no judgment at all. And that's mm -hmm. what the fifth agreement allows us to do, to spread our wings and the wings are imagination to create the most beautiful story and share it with all our loved ones. All right. So that I can work with because what I always thought that it meant, the conditional self-love part, was that sometimes you know that something is completely right for you. And in order to move towards that, you might have to say goodbye to people. Uh, yes. Break a few eggs, right? Uh, maybe hurt. Maybe it might be taken personal by some persons. But if you truly love yourself, you're going to do this. And uh, in, in the same vein, sometimes your head is going to tell you things. Um, and if you truly love yourself, you're going to ignore it. <laughs> yes. Because it's not the right thing that it's saying. And that and unconditional self-love basically means doing what you, in your deepest of inners, know what is right for you, even though that might be hard for other people or is difficult to do. That's what I thought that meant. So maybe a little bit, but I think this one is, <laughs> the real big one is way better. <laughs> yes. All right, thank you. Thank you, sir. We could go over. Uh, this was very interesting. Thank you, brother. For me as well. Um, there's a few more questions uh, I have um, because of your other books, because um, Wisdom of the Shamans and yes. uh, Shamanic Power Animals, I really like those because uh, what, the shamanic path seems to do and there's other things that um, and, and maybe this is an uh, uh, this uh, association is not correct but I also always kind of uh, associate with the occult like the supernatural the, I don't know if shamanism shamanism in your philosophy has supernatural aspects to it but if I read your story about the rattlesnake initiation well there was some funny stuff going on there so that might be in interpreted as uh, supernatural. But, but what it really does is what you were talking about earlier, like um, making sure that you become sort of a conduit so that whatever needs to be manifested can be manifested through you um, without you getting in the way with all your inhibitions and self-imposed constraints and stuff like that. And uh, what I liked about the book is that you give an insight into the tools that uh, shamans you use for this. Uh, and I would love to, to and power animals are uh, one of those tools. So I would love to like to talk a little bit about the techniques, interventions, kind of, well, I don't want to call them tricks because that, that doesn't really do honor, but the techniques that you use um, for this. So the first thing I would love to talk about a little, am I right in, into thinking that shamanism sometimes also touches the occult and the supernatural. How do you feel about that? Yes, uh, in shamanism, during the centuries, there's been a lot of superstition and manipulation. Mm -hmm. And that's why people get into the magic, into the, the distortion that separates us from the real message of life. Because shamanism is, a, is about magic. And just us being alive, we're magicians. We can create whatever. We can yeah. get inspired, see birds fly, and create airplanes. That's magic right there. What uh, what people begin doing is 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 being corrupt, you know, using fear, and using what is not. Because how would you get a kid to listen doing a magic trick? Oh, now they will listen, and then people believe in fairy tales. Now they're believing in fairy tales. Everything in shamanism, from my tradition, is philosophy. Mm. It's a metaphor, mm. and every religion, every story, every you know, walking in water, you know, opening up the oceans, all of that is philosophy, opening up the ocean in our head, 
you know, walking on water over the parasite, they're not drowning. There's so many walking on fire. And, but people like to make superstition. Why? Because they don't advance. They make it complicated. Mm -hmm. they, don't, they don't advance. And imagine generation, generation, generations, they corrupted all this. Then you have politics in the church, politics in the chiefs, and it's mm -hmm. not anymore about spirit. It's about power. Power with fake money, with fake things that it had corrupt spirituality. Now my father's message, it was to get that, that uh, magic of the shamanism, take the mm -hmm. superstition away out and make it very simple to the power of the word. So the four agreements is one of the most powerful shamanic tools there is because it shape shift into a language that everybody can read from a president, from a drug addict, from a sports person, from a supermodels in a fashion show, you know, for schools, it's become universal. Why? Because it's the truth of what we feel inside. Mm -hmm. Now we can all hear it. Before that, other books, they go like 10% to humanity, 8% to humanity. This book has been translated in more than 60 different languages, yeah. different religions, different beliefs, and it's not challenging them. It's getting them in their integrity because when we get in integrity, we can go in our own superstitious temples and beliefs and religions and take all that out in our homes. Mm -hmm. And that's exactly what we begin seeing. And there was a lot of people mad at my family and me when we changed traditions because <laughs> they don't want things to change. Like they want to stay with the landline phone, but now they exist cell phones. What if we never advance? It's just keeping landline, you know? And yeah. not, nothing against phones. I'm just using this as a philosophy, as a metaphor. Spirituality is always advancing because we're, the parasite mind, the dream is always, you know, making a, a counterfeit of it, mm -hmm. a fake. So this is one of the things when we talk honestly and pure about life, modern day shamanism is about what life is bringing us today. Hmm. In, in the same vein, I have a question um, about entheogenics because um, the only shamans I encountered uh, were the ones that were working with either ayahuasca or rape or DMT or psilocybin. Is that a part of your tradition at all? Or? Not at all. Not at all. All right. We don't, How do we you don't use that. Yeah, and uh, the ancestors used to do that because they live in mountains, they live in nature. That was mm -hmm. the part of overcoming fear. My family told me at this point, there's so much fear everywhere. You don't need that anymore. You have to get that contact and conquer your mind again. And if you mm -hmm. get a substance to put in you, you will depend on that substance to deal whenever it comes in life. But there's some times that you have to have your head clear. And what good does it do to you if you have the epiphany or some you know, thing over there? When we can overcome our fears without mm -hmm. any substance, just by the power of our faith in our word, that's what we're applying to see the dream. And uh, it's nothing against all the practices that do that. Just my father said to me, you know, I really want you to be present all the time. And this is why we, we don't teach that in our tradition, because we're, we're teaching you how to dream, you know, with, with clarity. Yeah. I once heard a teacher say something about this, like, he's like, well... Uh, the knowledge you get from those kind of ceremonies is sort of borrowed knowledge. So, so it's not, uh, you, you didn't gain it through experience. It was sort of told. Um, and his preference was in, in, in acquiring that knowledge through the experience because it integrated better. Um, I was just, just wondering about that. Um, but there's still some... Um, some things that I, I, I read about in your book, like, for example, um, the rattlesnake initiation. And if you look at that from the outside, um, it sort of looks like magic. Maybe it isn't really, but it, it kind of comes across that way because, well, it's a ritual. Could, could you perhaps uh, share your story about um, the ritual you went through with your brother uh, under the guidance of your father? Yes. You know, one of the most magical things is nature itself. When you look at the sky, you think about something and something appears. When you're just like walking down the, the, the canal and you see a deer with its baby and you see the life going on, you know. It, the beauty of nature is that there's magic happening all the time. Just like uh, right outside, me and my partner were talking and there was this squirrel and a hummingbird communicating. And mm. that for there is just a magical feeling. So when my father took us to nature in a place where my grandmother used to do her ceremonies, Yes, this is a rattlesnake infestation. There's a lot of rattlesnakes there in that land. Mm. So he took us to the highest mountain and then he played with a shadow and his shadow took the firming just like puppet shadow thing, like puppet shadows. He made his 
body into like a hand and make a form of a rattlesnake and he was dancing, you know, we begin hearing a bunch of rattlesnakes all around. Mm. And, and, and like the rattle, there's gonna be, we were close to a den probably. And my father said, close your eyes and connect with this mountain, respect this mountain. Use it as a mirror to feel yourself and give yourself into tranquility that you're respecting this mountain. And then we went for a, a deep meditation, me and my brother. And then when we opened our eyes, my dad was gone. He was probably going back down. And my brother hold my hand and said, are you ready to go down, Jose? And, uh, and I said, yes, I am. So we held hands tight. And we walked step by step, respecting that, that mountain after hearing all these rattlesnakes happening. But the moment that we, we touched the ground, we touched the ground, my father says, you went beyond fear, respecting fear. And that's the most powerful ceremony that could be in life, my children, is to respect, is to respect the fear because fear lets you know what you need to deal with. Feel, fear lets you know what your action is going to do, what's going inside of you. And then it came to the teaching of this little puppy. You know, he, my puppy just came home, so he came home running to me. But wow. when, ever since I, I get this puppy, it is like this puppy represents my body. It's my physical body. So when I go beyond fear, is to support my puppy, which is my physical body. Mm -hmm. And that's the point of that, of that, of that uh, initiation. It was the initiation to go beyond fear to protect myself from myself. Hmm. Interesting. Well, what I um, what I liked about it is um, the fact that what's um, what always seems to be the case with with shamanism is um, putting yourself into extreme situations, right? So very discomfortable or uncomfortable situations, like uh, sitting in a cave surrounded by rattlesnakes uh, as a, a, a regular. Pardon me for saying this, but as a regular human, that sounds like a very uncomfortable situation. Um, is, is there? A, a, and and um, I've I've heard about other rituals, and I don't know if if it's uh, the same with rituals from your own uh, practice. But there's always this big element of discomfort, or maybe sometimes even danger. Is that necessary for the learning process? No. But it, it, it is getting comfortable <laughs> no, in the uncomfortableness. <laughs> yes, it, it's uh, getting comfortable in the uncomfortableness. And yes. just imagine, you you are in the mountains, you're dealing with uh, with rattlesnakes, let's say. Now let's say you're in the city, you're walking down the alley, now you're dealing with people with poison like rattlesnakes. Mm. And they're saying things. It, it, it's the same thing of fear. I feel that humans can hurt you more than the rattlesnakes. Yeah. And it happens, um. and it happens something when we're in nature doing an act of power and when we say act of power is that, you know, we open our hearts and nature comes to us because nature is always listening because we're part of nature. We just don't speak its language. But when we enter shamanism, we begin speaking its language. And some shamans, you know, they're in, the, in their ego saying that they bring the rain, you know, they bring the animals. They, mm. No one brings anything. They join the party. <laughs> you know, they join the party. It's like going through us. Mm -hmm. So in, in my tradition, you know, we never get, uh, we, we didn't get trained to look at a, a paper and go do a speech or go do in class. We said, always speak from the heart. And that's exactly when we speak from the heart, that's what nature it is. So we're attracting nature. Mm. You know, when we open our heart, we're attracting the stars, but they're always there. But now they are respecting us that we can feel it. And exactly with, uh, with veganism, when I begin vegan, you know, I begin feeling like more little animals begin being getting close to me without being that, that fearful. They begin noticing that I'm respecting all life. And, you know, they begin feeling that I'm not a threat. And that's something beautiful in, in nature when we get taught with, let's say, with the tricksters, with the shaman tricksters that put us into uncomfortable positions. Mm -hmm. It's because if we surrender to that part of life, we can breathe anywhere. Like the day in yoga, no? an example. Yoga is one of the most difficult practices because you're doing all these things and the mindset can never do that. But when you're breathing through a painful pose, Mm -hmm. And then two years passes. That post is not going to be painful anymore. And the same thing in the situation of life. When we overcome all these fears, all these things we go into by back in our everyday life, it's different. When we are married two times in life, the third time we go up, we know that, you know, that person wasn't our, our partner. You know, there was something we're sharing life with because we are the love of our life. Because we marry ourselves for, you know, for better or worse. And this is the most beautiful thing that nature has to offer is when we speak its language and begin marrying nature. And what do I mean by marrying nature? 
is by accept and embrace life itself as it is. So when we accept life as it is, we have no expectations to be happy. Hmm. I have a question about that one, because one of the uh, aspects of that ritual was the fact, for example, you were given a black stone. And that one represented death. And you were just talking mm -hmm. about it, embracing life as it is. One of the things I deal with is, uh, I think, uh, above average fear of death. I really do not like the idea of not existing anymore or uh, knowing that it's coming. Um, but it's integral to everything that's on this planet. So I'm not going to escape that one. Um, what would you say to someone who, who is afraid of dying? Well, in little words, there's nothing fearful to do is natural to fear that but what i would say to them don't miss this opportunity to be present mm. in this moment detach from everything because you're going to detach from everything now it's time for you to be with you many times people go into meditation for the other reasons to calm their mind but the meditation from the third attention in the total tradition is to become inside of you and begin saying if you're going to be in coma you're going to be in coma but it's the opportunity of a lifetime it's the moment that if you're present enough and you have no time to put fear, you feel it, of course, it's natural. But if you're present enough, having that faith in you, putting that intent like you were speaking earlier, mm -hmm. having that faith and witnessing that magical point where we will leave the body, this is the most beautiful experience that could be. So forget about having fear, embrace it, because we're going to go there because there's two truths. We are alive, we're born and we die. Those are two truths that we really know in this life. Mm -hmm. So when that we get this epiphany, we're afraid to live life. We're afraid to let go. But yeah. when you say thank you, you embrace everything, everything begins to change because you're grateful to have had it. I understand what you're saying. I want to, and, and I really, what I like about death is that it, uh, like the Stoics say, uh, it gives flavor to the experience, right? Because you know it's infinite. You will appreciate every moment more. But I like this life so much. I, I love this, this dream because uh, I'm dreaming a, a very nice dream at the moment. Uh, I never want the dream to end. And I think there's a sort of sadness to that, where I sometimes have to deal with sort of melancholy. It's like, it's such a shame this has to end, right? Like, yes. like the, the aging, like becoming strong and then having to deal with uh, becoming weak again and surrendering to that. That's just something that my personality type finds, um, well, I'm going to have to deal with it, but it's going to be a struggle every now and then. Because if yes. I think about death, I'm like, oh, that's such a shame. <laughs> <laughs> could you could could you imagine that you're with somebody that you really love, that you're in love with, that you adore, that you do anything in the life for, and you're holding his or her hand? Mm. And uh, why even think about the day we're going to break up? Why even bring that into our awareness when we're having fun or we're just getting up the roller coaster or mm -hmm. the or the ferry wheel? We're gonna hold hands. Why even bring it up? Yeah. Now, now we're bringing our fears into our relationship. Ah, that's interesting. So you're saying, but but isn't that sort of like playing for team ostrich, like it's putting a, your head in the sand? Like it's about oh. the, it's, it's it's enjoying the now. It's enjoying the moment. Mm -hmm. You know, feelings are kind of come and go, and those feelings are want you to put a story to it especially yeah. fear. And, you know, and I admit, sometimes I think about one day, I'm not going to have my own thoughts anymore. I'm, I, I sit, I lay in my bed thinking one day I'm not going to be thinking. So I say to myself, before the day happens, I'm going to enjoy every moment that I have with the love of my life. That is me. Yeah. Yeah. And that's the way that I remove fear. And that fear turns into gratitude. Gratitude to the divine father and mother that they give me this life so I can experience it. And many people, they don't know how to let go. Mm. They don't know how to die in life that they're still suffering for the first marriage, even though they're 50 or 80. Yes. Are you um, aware of that poem by Chief, I want to say Tumuke? I, I mispronounced that name, but it's, it's uh, a poem about meeting your death. So in the end, you should not be like one of those men that begs for more time in the end but you should sing your death song like a hero going home. Like mm. you really truly lived your life. And I, I would truly like to be like that. At the, the, in between, yeah, you got to experience something. So you don't want this sentiment to take away your experience. But at the same time, I think you kind of have to be aware of it. So you 
check the boxes you need to check in, in terms of your own inner truth and able uh, to be able to sing that that death song like that hero go, going home if you talk about stories the story has to be completed for me i guess in order to be able to go for the next round I, i'm curious about how you feel about that by the way uh, but does that make any sense to you yes it, it's it's an enjoyment you know because i know that i'm energy and when i go i will leave my dreaming mind here and it's my dreaming mind who wants to survive mm. when i fall asleep completely deep i'm at peace i wake up and i remember who i am but it's my dreaming mind who's going to be let go of you know there's this powerful song that i love by a band called iron maiden and uh the the song is called hallowed be thy name and the end of the song is very powerful to me because it says when you know that your life is close at hand maybe then you'll begin to understand that life down here is just a strange illusion and it's a strange illusion we need fairy tale stories to not be afraid of things we mm -hmm. need to attach to things to in order to be happy we need to get the things that we don't have in order to be happy no one ever told us that where we're at is enough that life is enough that we can share life with one another that we try to conquer you know putting posts against one another's dream and my dream is the best you know someone gets a crayon and paints in our museum because they feel powerful enough when you yeah. find that peace in life you feel the gratitude and you let children be children my stepmother's great teaching before she died was to was uh, she mastered how to love everybody like they were their own children i'm not there yet but i'm in the point where i'm loving everybody like they were my own brother and sister and they deserve whatever life they have to do and whatever they do has nothing to do with me in order by the hand i liberate myself from trying to control them or fix them so i can enjoy the right mm -hmm. anyone who's going to go in my path and i'm going to encounter my path they have something for me and i have something for them but i respect what's going inside my dream so for right now i respect everybody's mind to live their dream no problem you know i even talk their language if they believe in aliens you know I talk their language who am i to to punch their bubble you know if they want to believe in anything let them have it because that's what's bringing them passion and joy because mm -hmm. for me is that that you have to have the ultimate truth the truth of love the truth of truth who cares about that we're going to forget it anyways what really matters is to be kind to yourself and to others in whatever you believe in mm -hmm. i think that's very true i'm i'm, I'm wondering um you know, since we're talking about uh, death um the, does the philosophy uh, the, the Toltec philosophy or your own personal uh, beliefs about this is there what, what's the nature of this existence like i've spoken to people that tell me well this is a learning experience and once this one is over you're going to go for another ride and another ride and another ride until you learn the lessons that you need to learn and i really like that idea somehow on the other hand they tell me you're going to experience every life on this earth and that makes me wonder if i really would want to go through that because i've seen a lot of different lives where i wonder well i don't know if i would i would do that but um how do you feel about that well if i was in my ego i would say that i'm going to i have come back before i was a master before i came into this life and now i'm going to be a master after i leave this life and it's not true sure the yeah. reality that i believe in is that we're the planet earth all of us all of us are the planet earth and i say this humbly we have our own let's say i have my ipad here that just died yeah a half an hour ago it was operating it was my dreaming mind but it died now i'm jumping into another phone that yeah. has the energy but i'm not the dreaming mind because the, the telephone could be my brain it's gone what You're i really that. am and what you really are is the energy that gives life to the phone that has a dreaming mind but we're not the phone word what gives that to the phone and that's why many people can channel and believe that they're magdalene or they're moses or they're Mo whoever they are you know merlin whoever they want to channel it's because it's the same soul mm. we have yeah. our intent and like we we're saying earlier our faith and intent nothing going to stop us that we're going to use this instrument this guitar to play our song but it's just a different thing to do it but when we begin channeling ourselves we're not submitting suppressing ourselves as a human as an artist that we're doing someone else's art we're doing our own art but i really believe that we are all the energy that creates this beautiful dream and planet being alive and you know by you and me speaking right now we're creating this energy that's going to be trapped into this energetically com uh, internet thing in the world you know that's going to be eternal it could be eternal it sure. could be 
a thousand years and someone can come up and listen to this conversation. We're not going to be here, but our energy will be. So when they tap into this phone, into this conversation, they will feel us. Mm. Just like we feel Jesus, Siddhartha, Quetzalcoatl, they're all parts of contributing into this dream. And we're contributors to this dream too. So what's our purpose in life? To create. Mm. What's I'm offering our heart to the altar? It comes with gratitude. I've thought about this a lot because um, the, the, very common in a, a lot of uh, philosophies is the whole um, guy and mother spirit thing. Like, and it, it kind of makes sense, right? If you look at it like a sun, rays of light on something, earth, plants, animals, all that stuff. And there's something that I learned about a while back. I don't know if you've ever heard about this, but this is morphic resonance, um, which is sort of a, a, a frequency that... Um, Apparently, um, information exchanges across, uh, maybe you heard about this anecdote, uh, but uh, across species, like, like they had a sort of uh, internet amongst themselves. There were, for example, monkeys on an island that learned how to treat certain food by washing it in the river. And then other monkeys learned it as well. And then uh, all of a sudden, there was a critical mass of monkeys. And then uh, other monkeys that were isolated on other islands started showing the exact same behavior. And people who are fans of that morphic resonance theory basically tell us, see, this is sort of evidence that there's sort of a collective consciousness going on that exchanges information with each other. Um, And um, it's it's like an energy field. And if you're uh, uh, like an entity, uh, an animal or a human, you're basically an expression of that energy. Uh, and if, if I listen to you, it comes and goes, and there's going to be uh, other ones. But this particular signature is unique for now. And that's what makes it so special, right? Yes. Yes, because we're co-creating even what our elders did 2,000 years ago. We're still co-creating. We're advancing. That's why my grandma said, if I catch you doing what I did, you're killing the totic tradition. And I go, what do you mean, grandma? Don't copy me. This was my life. I overcame myself. Life will continue on and you have to overcome yourself and you're going on passing the torch forward and forward and forward because this is the dream that we live in. And it is contagious. This is how religious became to born because we have the spoken words, the knowledge, and we projected an extension of our brain, which in the religious point of view, our brain is the house of God, is the house of devotion. So we build a church, we build uh, a pyramids, we build all these places of divine worship. Mm-hmm. And um, but it was an extension of that. So at one point in life, people b- begin not following that and thinking that they can only be, you know, sacred and respectful inside the house of a church or a building, and they forgot to be the main point that this was inside of us. And there's a lot of distortion. That's why there's no new message. It's always the common sense original message from the beginning of time. Old wine and new bags, basically. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, I, oh, wow. And then, yeah, so we're kind of not doing what your grandma told us to do. So we're reinventing the same lessons over and over again, where you would hope that we would kind of like build upon those lessons. Or yeah, are well, we actually doing that? I think we're progressing as humans. I mean, it's, it's, it's sometimes it's tough and we make mistakes, but if I look at our history, we do seem to be building upon knowledge and expanding on it. If it's for the right, well, that's something to be discussed and we might improve on that, but it's definitely what we're doing. Yes, exactly. And one thing that I I love about this is that my grandmother, before she passed away, she was telling me that the Divine Mother's uh, teachings are going to come. And I go, what do you mean? You'll see. Because she she used to be a a curandera, a healer from her tradition that healed plants, vegetables, and all other kinds of uh, nature things. So you know, when she said that, I remember her doing these killings. And now when I go to the supermarket, brother, when I go to the supermarket, I see a juice, a juice place. And then I see all those juices, the detox, the cleansing, the good for eyes. I see all the ingredients that she used to use in her little ah. in her little room. But now it's being in the supermarket. And people, not religiously, not, not, not going to temples, they're going to the supermarket. They're going to exercise and they're putting that in their body. So mm-hmm. the divine mother is coming back for no one can see. And it's about taking care of your physical being. And that's interesting to see. And we never see the change how we imagine it to be. It always comes someplace because we never see it coming. But this is the most beautiful thing about ourselves. When we begin working on ourselves, we don't see the change. But others begin seeing it. 
mm-hmm. because we're living in the moment. And this is now I talk about ghost town. We're not what we think we are when we grow. That's why when we wake up, we cannot go back to sleep. But many people try to go to sleep. They try to fit in what doesn't serve them anymore. And that's why they become unhappy. Mm-hmm. Yes, yes. Um, I like what you said about, um, how did you call it? The nature's, the, the, the mother nature's coming back? Yes, mother nature's coming back. Yeah, my mother nature. Let thy food be thy medicine. Um, and uh, I think that if you, uh, if I, uh, at least if I look around me, there does seem to be an increase in awareness when it comes to taking good care of, like like self love in the most physical sense. Uh, maybe there's some optimizations to be had in the spiritual sense. But yeah, I understand, man. It's uh, it's it's definitely up and coming. So that's, I think that's a good thing because. The, and that's maybe something we can speak to as well. I don't know if that's part of shamanic tradition, but I know oh, yeah. that, that the way I treat my body greatly influences um, how pure, how well, pure, um, if my thought process is cleaner or dirtier than normal. So if I exercise regularly, I don't eat too much junk. My thought processes are way more clearer and way more harmonious than when I... Yes not do these things? What, 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 how do you look at that from a shamanic point of view? It's that you're present to the order of the divine. And you're, whenever something happens, you're there ready to take charge of that order of taking care of your physical body. So all of us know when our physical body is not doing that good. And this is the moment that we unlearn what we put in our physical body and put something that makes our physical body better. And this is something that I did like six years. That's one of the reasons I went vegan because if I didn't go vegan in my way because I was very unhealthy, I used to wear 260 pounds or 250 something pounds, 100 more than 100 pounds that I weigh right now. Mm. And I was I was really I was ready to check out. My body was unhealthy, and if I wanted to continue doing what I love to do, I had to walk my talk. So I used my Toltec, you know, magic that is to unlearn. I used all my intent to unlearn to take care of my physical body. And here I am, I hurt, I, I healed my heart, I healed my liver, I, I, I healed my lungs, I healed mm-hmm. everything that was going inside of me just because I put that effort and my, my mind said, you cannot go for running anymore, you cannot do exercises, your knees are bad. And I go, silencio, Jose. <laughs> and I continue doing it every day, every day. People say, you cannot do it, people judge me, no problem, I will do it. I wanna listen to them because I'm doing it for the love of my life, I'm doing it for my nature. Because this is my nature. Yeah. This is where I live. This is my home. And I need to feel good. You know, there was a point I couldn't breathe anymore. I stood up and I, I was out of breath. And, and I said, I'm not walking my talk. I say that I love the body. I love life. But look at how I'm treating my body. And, you know, and this is the point of the Toltec that you can change your life to anybody. Because you're unlearning what doesn't serve you anymore. And only you know, whoever is listening, only you know what's not serving you. You don't need someone to tell you to do this to you. You know, your respect for yourself, you will know. And that's the moment that shamanism breaks up. It's nothing personal. It's just the truth. Mm. Sometimes we need to let go of an old way so the new dance can begin. Yeah. Let's talk a little bit more about letting go of that old way. Because if I look at myself and my old ways, they're usually there because of uh, uh, some sort of self-protection. You talked about numbing. Uh, certain uh, things that you uh, judge yourself on. And I think this is uh, related to it. Can we talk a a little bit about Toltec inventory and recapitulation? Or uh, I don't know if that's how it's pronounced. Recapitulation. I don't know if I pronounced that. It's it's to to really wake up in a a dream quest, in a vision quest. Mm. And the vision quest is to look at yourself from an impersonal point of view to look at your reactions from a personal point of view, to look at your reactions with not defending them at all, just looking what you do. So what happens when you see that? You look at your whole life and there's no justifications. You're just seeing how it is. So in your awareness, you see something that you don't like, change it. Simple as that. Because one of the reasons to feel our domestication is to break it. Mm-hmm. We got to aware how we're domesticated and when we become aware how we're domesticated, we let it go, and then we begin re-domesticating ourselves. I have to ask, by the way, because I've I've seen these I've seen one of these muppets now. So, what's the last one called? 
They look this adorable, not- by the way. For the people oh, that are was- watching the videos, he's, there, there are two adorable puppies in the screen right now. And I'm just wondering what these Muppets are called. So, <laughs> Yes, this one, on, this one on my right, this one is Yogi. Yogi. And this, and this is Nami, Nami Namsters. Yeah. The, do, the namaste in the yoga. <laughs> I'm sorry. It's namaste. It was namaste, but we call him Nami Namsters. Ah. But he was he was inspired by by Nami and Jogi. He's a, he's the third Jogi in my life, but it's because of, of you know Jogi Yogananda. Okay. Yes. I thought Jogi Bear, but no, I don't know who Jogi Nanda was. So who- yeah, it's from the Hindu tradition, the like Swamis, and ah. uh, and the, and the Tibetan they call Jogis. So I, I have fun, you know, because they, when people ask me, do you have a yogi? I go, yes. It's yeah, pure love. It is. <laughs> I did something similar with a cat once. And I, I used to do Brazilian jiu-jitsu really fanatically. And I named my cat Rix and Gracie. <laughs> oh, I love that. <laughs> sort, of, sort of the same thing. Um, but it, it kind of brings me to uh, what I w- wanted to ask you about. Because um, the, the, the Toltec inventory and recapitulation, like, like you said, is... Uh, looking at yourself objectively and um, determining what the right path would be, looking at the dream you would like to live if you would be impeccable with your word, correct? Mm-hmm. Yes. Okay. And, and, and also to do healing, to do healing in ourselves. And healing is basically to acknowledge and to let go. Is to let go situations that doesn't serve us anymore. Hmm? Is that the same as forgiveness or is it different? It, it is forgiveness in action. It is forgiveness without expecting to hear from people is that you learn the lesson. And the true forgiveness is not that people forgive you for what you did. It's for us to get the point to not repeat that act again to the people that we know now and tomorrow. Hmm. Do, do you feel and whenever that... people? Hmm? Oh, no, I'm sorry. Please finish your sentence. No, and when people are ready to forgive us in that's their choice, we're not going to be beggars to forgive them. To, to ask us to forgive us when they're ready, they're ready. But the most thing that we can do when we want forgiveness is to not repeat the acts. And especially when we hurt ourselves. Let's say, you know, I'm in AA and I've been wanting to heal myself. And, uh, and, and that act of AA, you know, I begin taking care of, taking care of myself and not wanting to drink, not wanting to do these things, walking, walking my talk. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and I could see everything that led me that everything that, that alcohol took away from me and the people that I hurt, but now I get my power back in order to forgive myself is to not put that poison in my body anymore. Uh, yes, I understand. I, I have a, a, a follow-up question on that though, um, because I've wronged people in my life as everyone has, but uh, there have been cases where I sort of came clean so I confessed and there was forgiveness. Sometimes I confessed and there wasn't conf- uh, forgiveness, but there are still wrongs that I really haven't confessed to. However, I bear that, uh, I bear that cross for myself because I somehow feel, why should I revisit this uh, past wrong with this person in order to feel better a little bit for myself? But some people would say, no, you have to definitely come clean and confess to this. What are your thoughts on this? Because my personal feeling is like, I don't have to bother people with this if I learned my lesson. Yeah. Well, the, the thing is that we don't need to disrupt no one's dream. Because sometimes when we do acts of that we're not so proud of that hurt us, just mm-hmm. our very presence in their face can we open their wounds. And how selfish it is just to open someone else's wound on, for us to be healed? No. Like I said before, mm-hmm. we, change, we, change, we change ourselves. We don't have to gossip about ourselves. Like you have the epiphany, oh, this happened, but I haven't voiced it out, but in me, I'm already working on it. Mm-hmm. I don't need, something inside of you is telling you not to go there. And someone who's blind faith, no, you have to do that. You have to do that. You have to do that. It's like someone saying to you, no, you now you have to marry this girl. Now you have to marry this boy. Now you have to do this, you know, because you promised. No, you did that act. It's in your consciousness, but that act helped you in your life to not do it again. Mm-hmm. But you don't have to gossip about it yourself, especially when you feel it already. When you feel something, and you honor it. Mm, yeah, you have, if you respect the feeling, then you learned your lesson, and there's no need to open the wounds again, because that would mm-hmm. cause more damage and disrupt their experience of life and take away happiness. So that's yes, not an act of love, basically. That's an act of selfishness. Exactly, because for some people, we're dead, you know? Yeah, all right. They don't have us in their life anymore, so 
we're not invited. And why should we go and in, in, in disrespect their life just for us to feel okay when they're already gone? That was a perfect lesson to see, you know, like if we had an abusive relationship, that's it, you know, we're not going to give them no wings to think that we're going to get back together. Mm-hmm. It's done. I understand. But if they come to us, then that's a different story. Yes. All right. All right. Yeah. So the, thank you. Thank you for clarifying that. That, that makes it more clear to me. Um, now, I, I would like to talk about, because, uh, of course, we had uh, your beautiful uh, dogs uh, uh, in the screen right now. I would like to talk about uh, the relationship between shamanism and animals, uh, also referring to your last book, uh, Shamanic Power Animals. I really like this one, though. Um, I have a few questions, but first, could you speak to um, the relationship between animals, shamanism, and the human dream in general? Well, with the animals, we can see our instincts, our human instincts, because growing up, humanity thinks that it's not an animal. Mm. But like you said earlier, one of the most powerful animals is the human, because he has the ability to hunt them all or to save them all. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And the one that we've been hurting, instead of, you know, we've been hurting this animal, we humans hurt ourselves, that's why we hurt all the animals. Mm-hmm. But when we look at the animals, they're just loving beings. They have their own language, they have their own world, and they're a big inspiration because they're beings of love. So every animal is different, and every animal you can find medicine. But the human is a shape shifter of all those animals who get inspired by them. So in this book, I let the reader know that they can choose the reflection to find the power of intent to overcome anything that's challenging in their life in a personal moment right now, Mm -hmm. that they can feel the connection between the spirit animal. But this is now what we're talking earlier about the energy in reincarnation. There's only one energy. So we're connecting really with the energy of the animal's life force and our life force becoming one life force. So the epiphany of seeing life is as life itself. From that point on, we begin being free from the human domestication. Now see this powerful point now. Now when we make surrender, when we're in our integrity, imagine the power that we have when we go back to use the word. It's different now. Mm -hmm. It has magic in it. Yes, and um, so, so if I understand this correctly, what we're doing in relation to power animals, is basically sort of channeling their symbolic essence. So, for example, if I would uh, be in a situation where maybe a little bit of proactivity or uh, assertiveness would be required, I could choose to. Uh, I don't know. I don't know if this is exactly what I, I think I heard you talk about this earlier. Um, channel my inner jaguar, so to say, because I kind of know what the jaguar is a symbol for same same as a lion or or maybe a fox they they are certain archetypes and if i channel a fox i might be smart and cunning and maybe not too uh, frontal in my approach but if i would choose to channel my light my inner lion i would be all up in your face and wouldn't budge uh, a millimeter probably because i would feel that would would serve to dream my dream in the most optimal way. Is that, is that right? Yes. And, uh, and, and, and one of the examples that I got is, is that uh, this yogi, I channeled this yogi and this puppy, and he gave me a, 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 a beautiful lesson. One time I took him to, a, I was taking him to a course, and I mm-hmm. told everybody that a yogi is coming on a Saturday night before the Sunday. And, and, and everybody thought that, that like, like I said earlier, a, a Tibetan or a Hindu yogi was coming to visit them. But no, mm-hmm. it was this little being of pure love. When he arrived and I said everybody to open their eyes, the first thing they all did was just melt it into this little beautiful animal, you know, this little beautiful creature in their love. They were like, they're dropping their thing. Like, oh, how cute. But there yeah. was this gentleman who wasn't enjoying the weekend at all. He was like this all the time. And when the yogi came in, my puppy, he goes, oh, now we're going to learn from a dog. Yeah, and he's like, and, and and you know, in that order, my puppy was going wiggling its tail to everybody, you know, it, it was just wiggling its tail to everybody, and and then uh, when he got to him, he, he ignored him. But did my puppy take it personal? No, he wiggled his tail and moved to somebody else. So in that moment, the yogi gave me the biggest lesson: is when I'm feeling open-hearted, 
I channel the spirit of the puppy. I go there, you know, hug everybody, <laughs> connect with everybody. And if someone goes like this to me, oh, nothing to do with me. I move along and I'm the spirit of the puppy. Yeah. The spirit yeah. of love. That's one of your example I wanted to share. <laughs> I like to think of that of channeling my uh, inner Labrador. Th those are the <laughs> most friendly, happy dogs you'll ever encounter. I'm like, I wish I could be more like that every now and then. So I, com I completely get what, you, um, what that is, is trying to do. And it's, it's actually a very um, uh, interesting and very easy tool um, because it kind of adds to your flavor of the experience. Because if I start thinking about lions, I'm starting to associate with everything I think the lion stands for. And that's maybe one final part we could we could talk about and then I will uh, stop stealing your time. <laughs> oh, no. I'm having a blast, by the way. I'm having yeah, a, me too, brother. Thank you so time. much. Yeah, um, but I would talk to, uh, like to talk a little bit more about um, the importance of symbolism, uh, especially to the subconscious, because I think what the Power Animals uh, book showed me was that there are certain things that um, are to my subconscious archetypical. Like I said about the lion, the fox, there's a certain set of behaviors that we associate with this, but this is not just true for uh, um, animals. There are probably other symbols that are used. And I was just wondering about the importance of symbol and how you use it in a shamanic perspective. So how can we use it to our benefit? Mm. It's a very good question because the symbology is what makes our imagination, our presence, unlock a code of art. Mm. Because the artist paints in symbols a message. Yes. It's not only just a painting, it's a message, it's a story. And when we are clean slate, let's say we go to the pyramids of Teotihuacan, there is message, there are symbols everywhere, and they all will communicate with you and you will become a narrator of what you see. Mm. And now they tell you, what is the symbol telling you? The answer they will tell you. And a little example for me, the, the Mexican symbol of the eagle devouring the snake above the cactus tree. You know, many of my fellow Mexicans, they don't know this symbol. They don't know this symbology of what it means. They just think that it's the symbol that the Aztecs saw to create the Nortistlan. But the symbol of the Mexican uh, um, sim symbol, this Mexican symbol of the eagle, the devouring the stake about the cactus tree and the flag underneath. That's mm. a moment of celebration of humanity's personal freedom because they're using the animals as a symbology that's saying the eagle represents the truth in this symbol mm. and the snake represents the lie. And the cactus represents the human mind. And in the Aztec tradition, they say wherever the Aztecs will see an eagle devouring a snake, above a cactus tree, that's where they're gonna build their home. Mm. That's where there is home. And of course they built this river, the Nochitlan, you know, they cover Mexico City, you know, and build pyramids above it. But it was just a metaphor because the symbology that spoke to me, it is wherever I find my truth, devouring my snake in my mind, then I am home. Mm. That Mexican symbol becomes a universal symbol of humanity of independence, of the power of the word, because our truth will overcome our lies. And when we do that in our own mind, we are presently home with our power. And then it's when we see life differently now. We don't see with the eyes of guilt, jealousy, shame, or ego, personally important. No, we see with the love of eyes of respect. And then we respect everybody's dream, even the ones who do negative things. Mm -hmm. Their acts of negativity, will encourage something in life to overcome that. The ego will come out and devour the snake. And this is the point of view, how I see life. That kind of makes me think about something that, um, are you still there by the way? Yes, my, oh, my you're mother. Kind of, yeah, I was just, was, <laughs> sorry. Um, uh, about uh, a phenomenon called synchronicity, because I think symbols are only symbols if you're ready. Like uh, I can look at something and another person can look at something and they, this can have no meaning what, whatsoever to them. While for me, it has great importance. Um, how does shamanism uh, and how do you personally look at those little, I call them wings from the universe. Sometimes there are coincidences that I can't just brush off as coincidences, but I know they're only important to me. 
someone else wouldn't find these things important at all. Um, and that sometimes makes me wonder, like, is there someone messing with me or something? Like, maybe there is a bigger plan. I don't know. Um, how do you feel about that? Yeah, because symbols are really meant for us. Mm. When we get the, the experience of seeing something beautiful in the woods, we were there. We felt it. It did something to us. We don't have to call the Vatican to come and do an investigation to see if it was a miracle or not when they're not going to even be there. <laughs> okay. Yes, I understand. I understand. So if it had value to you, you don't have to overanalyze it. Just take the message and do what you what, what you think it means you have to do in order to be impactful. Ex to exactly, you because it, it, it hits you directly, especially if you're thinking something or something. It, uh, from the moment it hits you, you, it's for you the message. And you know it, you own it. It's a feeling. But the interesting part is when we resist a needle in half year of doing it, we distort the story <laughs> of how it comes out, of what we see. And whoever we tell it is not going to be the same as when we were right there. But when you're right there, this is the magic that I was talking about earlier when me and my brother were with the rattlesnakes. Mm. We were in nature. We were alive. We were ourselves again. Yeah. And to someone like me, all those rattlesnakes going off at the same time, right? That's almost too coincidental to just, like, you know, are you really sure that your grandmother wasn't, like, watching and, like, hey, guys, come on, make some noise. Like, there's some sort of, because it's almost too coincidental. And, of course, if you rationalize it, there's all kinds of uh, things you can think of as logical explanations. But even though that's true, uh, sometimes they have... Uh, the, it's the significance that you add to it. Yes, and I was, and, and I was wondering how you feel about um, if that significance is maybe sometimes just your brain detecting patterns, or oh, maybe yeah. there's really something to it. Maybe sometimes my mother or grandmother is actually, my ancestors are giving me little nudges or uh, guiding me. Um, some philosophies truly believe uh, in these things. How do you feel about that? Well, the, the grandmothers and, and families always honoring us because they want the best for us. And that intent and wish will always be eternal. If they make it once, it's going to always be eternal. No matter what we do in life, no matter what situation we're in, that energy is around us because we carry and honor that. And the moment that I was coming down the, 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 the mountain with my brother with all those rattlesnakes, all those rattlesnakes that were rattling their tail, they were afraid, just like me and my brother were. So we were reflecting that to each other. The moment that we both say we're not harmed to each other, we're watching our steps. We're both controlling our both fears in order to go along instead of attacking each other out of fear. And they come another experience years later. When that happened, probably like 13 years later, I was in this ceremony in Tennessee. And I was going to do this, um, this nature mitote, mitote ceremony, you know, with a lot of people outside, but it was in nature. But the owner of the land said, we cannot do it anymore. And we asked why, because these bugs started coming in and they were going to just invade. They were not going to leave. So when my, I went to my father, I said, father, if the ceremony is done. He goes, what do you mean it's done? Well, they cancel it. They can cancel it. Go. He goes, he told me, go. Have faith in you and go and you will know what to do in the moment that you know what to do. So there I am with the instructions of my teacher. And then the owner of the land saying it cannot happen and all those people waiting. I open my mouth and box can come in, but something happened. Um, I noticed that people wanted freedom. And then I noticed the bugs wanted freedom, but they were doing kamikaze. They were almost suicide under the fire. They were throwing themselves into the fire pit. Mm -hmm. And I don't know what got into me. I got this hand, I got it, I, I, dumped, I, I, I dumped it in a bucket of water. And then I put my hand inside the flame and I begin pushing all the bugs that started coming doing suicide. They're starting thinking that they were going for the light because it was nighttime. I started pushing them away for like two, three minutes. I just started doing this and everybody was watching me. And then all of a sudden there were no bugs. Why was that? I don't know. But my intention was I didn't want them to die. Mm. And that's what my heart told me. And after that was been, I honored the land. I honored these beautiful creatures. So I can have permission to open my mouth and share my love with everybody who was participating in that ceremony. I didn't know what I was doing. My father told me to go there and I would know exactly what to do. And the thing was to respect life. Yeah. And if you would have spoken to me five years ago, I would probably rationalize the ever-loving hell out of that. But right now, I think that's, that's remarkable. 
And I don't really know what to think about it, but my intuition tells me there's something more to that somehow. Uh, so I, I find these kind of stories, I always get a little prison when I hear stuff yeah. like that. I think, I think that's amazing. So, yes, um, and I, yeah. <laughs> thank you. Um, oh, thank you, brother. And, and I was feeling, you know, for, for stories. Excuse me. I was, I was, thank you for the sharing of your uh, stories uh, and, and your wisdom. So, um, uh, as uh, we usually do at this podcast, if our readers uh, would like to know more about you or maybe read one of your books, um, where can they uh, find more about you and your family? Well, I, I, you can find what me and my family are doing in my father's website called miguelris.com. And there's always stuff happening. And all the three of us have, have uh, social medias. And my, my brother shares, I share. And, I, I, and my father shares sometimes. But I, I like to share on Mondays in English. Um, in, in, I share sometimes in Spanish during the week. But in, on Mondays, every Monday in the morning, I share something from the heart. It could be um, 10 minutes or half an hour up to 15 minutes. I just talk. And that you can find me on Instagram so I can speak with everybody just channeling. But I, I am so happy that, uh, that the, in November and the late November, I, I'm going to have the opportunity to go to Amsterdam. I know you're from Dutchland. So I'm going to be in Amsterdam. About to ask, uh, are you planning on coming to Europe? Because if so, I would love to invite you uh, oh. to maybe meet or do another podcast. We, uh, we can do a live uh, recording. I would love that. I would love that brother so much. I would love it very much. Yes, and, and I, I will be in, in, in Milano, in, in, uh, in Italy in, in November. And then after that, I go straight to Amsterdam. And uh, my, my friend Patricia and, and brother Shane are, are organizing one event for me to speak there in November. So I look forward to meeting in, in person and continue talking because there's still so much to talk about. I feel the same way. Well, let's set this up. Um, I'm going to send an email to Carla about this and uh, we'll, we'll get connected somehow. But uh, that would be amazing. And well, it's great. Um, and maybe to our listeners, uh, this event that's going to be, uh, that's going down in November, is that something they can buy tickets for? Yes. And, and oh, there, will be more infor- there will be more information on miguelris.com as, as, the, as the month comes in. But I, I know this from the inside. So I know this is happening because it was supposed to happen two years ago or a year before the COVID. Perfect. Perfect. Um, if you guys, uh, if you let your team Connect to us. Uh, we'll send out uh, some information to our listeners as well because I'm, I'm very oh. sure there's a lot of interested people there. So we're uh, we're, we're going to set you up. Um, thank, oh, thank you so much, brother. Yeah, of course, of course. Um, and we're going to meet up in November. It's going to be it's going to be awesome. yes. <laughs> great. Um, thank you so much to our listeners. Uh, please go check out uh, these wonderful books. They brought so much uh, uh, wisdom into my life. Uh, the four agreements or the the five agreements. Uh, wisdom of the shamans, and of course. Um, shamanic power animals go check it out um don jose thank you so much uh, listeners see you guys next time cheers Ciao. thank you brother michael